Thank you so much. You want to, maybe we should sit closer, then you can actually get yeah. us both in free, that'd be good. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Hi, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name's Hugh Lemmy. Um, I'm a communications director at ZBox. Um, we're here today at the Foundry, which is our uh, office in, uh, in Vauxhall, and I'm here talking to Paul Mason, author of uh, Post to our future. And we're going to be talking about um, cooperatives and how cooperatives might feature in a post-capitalist society. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet, <laughs> but I've been really enjoying the bits I have, I have read. Um, and uh, it really feeds on, I think, from um, some of your earlier books. Um, first of all, uh, Live Working or Die Fighting, which is a, a global history of the working, working class which really focuses on the development of, the, of a working class identity as an agent of political struggle. And then on to um, your later books, Meltdown, which is mainly about the 2008 financial crisis and the roots mm. of that. And then um, Why It's Kicking Off every, uh, Everywhere, which is about the sort of upsurge in activism in political change across the world, um, starting after the, the, that financial crisis of 2008 and going into the Arab Spring and things mm. like that. Um, which incidentally was where we first met, was talking about that book when you're in the mm. process of writing it. And um, to me it seems that these uh, three books have a, 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 a consistent theme, mm. which is the development and collapse of the working class as a, uh, as a subject of, uh, oh, sorry, as an actor of political change. Mm. And then now the development of um, a new form of, should we call it a subjectivity, like a way of thinking, a way of life, which might sort of engender a new political change mm. and this book is uh, I think it's fair to say focusing on the economics as well as the subjectivities mm. that are changing is that fair to say yeah yeah um there's, a, there's an interesting thought experiment which you uh, which you talk about within the book uh, by herbert simon come uh, which he did in, in 1991 which was imagining a classic mm. uh, classic thought experiment of martians coming down what do they see and uh, he described the world uh, in this thought experiment in three ways, which is that uh, there's big green blobs, which are the organisations, which is what they'd see as the world being made up of. Uh, and within these organisations, there are blue lines and dots, which is the hierarchies of control uh, of organisation, uh, the dots being the people within those hierarchies. And then between both those dots and the organisations is red lines, which are the market transactions. And that is what a classic capitalist society would look like. And inter into this, you introduce um, an idea of yellow lines, which is um, exchanges of goods, labours and services, which happen collaboratively or outside a market or organisation. Yeah. Would you care to sort of expand on that? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I probably should have called them white lines. <laughs> because, um, but if I had, there wouldn't have been lines, if you see what I mean. If you can, ima can you imagine, uh, Herbert Simon's thing is green blobs, red lines, inside the green blobs, um, 
hierarchy diagrams in blue, and I've basically gone in the book, you know, suppose the Martians are there waiting to zap Earth. Um, they go, hold on a minute, there's something new happening here. So in the last 20 years, a different kind of line emerged. But conceptually, that, those lines are so invisible to the market that they should be white. In fact, in a subsequent book, I might call them cream or faded, <laughs> fading. Um, and what is more, you can have blobs that are the same colour. That is because you can have organisations and relationships. I net, if you imagine a network diagram, blob and uh, especially a decentralised network, blob and um, lots of lines connect, connecting them. So the original idea of Herbert Simon's thought experiment was to show that the world is not really a market economy, that it's mainly an organisational economy, and he was obsessed with organisational science. And the, the idea behind my thought experiment is to, is to, is to dramatise and illustrate the idea that there, are two, there is a new kind of economy emerging. Um, and what the book says, shall I just say what the book says? Yeah. Yeah. So what the book says is that within capitalism, information technology has created the possibility and beginnings of a new kind of economy um, that is neither market nor state. And it, it, th that it's the result of three things. First, the zero, the zero marginal cost effect, which you can read all about in Jeremy Rifkin's book, Zero Marginal Cost Revolution. Uh, but it was pointed to in 1990 by an economist called Paul Romer, who said that information goods are different. If you can copy and paste something, the, the cost of reproducing it actually will fall quite quickly to zero, and therefore its price over time should, and the profits makeable on it will also fall to zero. Now, if you're in the book business, uh, or in the, um, if you're a, a, a music artist, you, you've experienced this very clearly, that, that the copy and paste effect of an information good um, disrupts the price mechanism. Now, in the last 20 years, what capitalism has done in response to that is to create unusual kinds of monopolies, monopolies that only exist in order to actually defend IP. They don't exist just to take over, you know, uh, the HS and Topeka and Santa Fe Railway taken over by the Great Western Railway, gradually creating one big railway company, Pacific, whatever, in America. It's not that. It's, it's, it's monopolies created from scratch simply to give IP value that it doesn't have. Um, and I argue that those can't last. But in any case, what they've already done is they've disrupted the price mechanism. The price of an iTunes track is 99p uh, or zero if you pirate it. Um, it doesn't depend on supply, demand or quality. It just depends on Apple. And I've, in the book, I provo provocatively state that Apple's mission statement properly described should be uh, we prevent the abundance of music. Um, because music could be abundant. We, you wouldn't have to need, everybody doesn't need to own all the tracks, they're all sitting there, we could just share them. If you look at what's happened over time, over 10 years, Apple's monopoly, once 95% of online music sales, is falling. I don't know what it is now, because of course most of online music isn't sold. But the Spotify bit, there's a very interesting statistic. You'd need a, a thousand plays on iTunes to earn a, the minimum wage, and a million plays on Spotify to earn the minimum wage. So the price is falling. It's following the curve that Roma and zero price come in. We're just only just started. Zero price effects predict. So number one, price is dissolved by information technology. Number two, the relationship between work and wages is uh, falling apart. No, it's not completely falling apart. And at two ends of the spectrum, different effects take place. At my end, Possibly for many of you as well. I'm looking at the quite laid back place we're in. Actually, the building, if you took the building as an abstract from all organisations, I bet there's not a single clocking in board in this building. And if people turn up and go, I, five minutes late, sorry, my dog sitter didn't turn up. It's always sortable. Yeah. So, but at the extreme end of high skilled work, what's happening is that we're paid to exist. We're paid to attach our brain to a project and not to another project. And while our brain and persona and reputation often, so big computer program or big, or big author, yeah, is attached to an organisation, um, that brain is supposed to be working. Um, and the, the points when it's working and not working are actually very difficult to, 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 to identify. If you sit on a, on, a, on a commuter flight, it doesn't have to be in business class, an early morning commuter flight, Brussels to London or whatever, is full of people working. They're not being paid by the hour to work. Their, their, their pay represents some notional amount of work. And in fact, they're sitting so close together that if it was a factory, it would be banned. But they're actually just working like this for two or three hours, putting off information. The work and, and, the, 
and the pay don't match each other precisely. Now, at the bottom end of the scale, uh, David Graeber has pointed out what, what the impact has been. That we could be automating so many unskilled jobs, it's unreal. But instead of automating, we, think we go on creating them. And what a lot of people who work at this bottom end of the, of the, of the skills uh, uh, ladder do is that what the Soviet Union's workforce used to do, which was summed up in the saying, we pretend to work, you pretend to pay us. Uh, no, that doesn't mean people who work for, say, Ocado or Amazon aren't under a lot of ti relentless time uh, management. But, again, it's, 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 it's almost futile time management because it's actually not there to produce productivity. Low-skilled jobs have become very, very unproductive. You know, what can, I mean, just imagine what, what a picker in Tesco walks around the store picking things out and putting them in a basket. Uh, whereas at Ocado, they stand in front of a thing that comes past them, so they pick it off the shelf. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, one is automated, one isn't. But even then, a picker. I mean, has anybody seen one of these things that, you know, like in a car factory where the robot picks, analyzes, looks at, goes, yeah, that's an egg. Do, you know, yeah. We're not automating. So the third thing is that the information does, as well as dissolving the price mechanism and dissolving the link between work and wages, I argue, is that it creates the beginnings of a, of a, of a new kind of economy. Modularity, a, a very simple technological uh, you know, development, which is far more significant under information econ economics than under normal uh, analog in, in economics, um, is, has created the ability to do work horizontally. That is unmanaged work, uh, distributed work, networked work, work who, whose product is not obviously owned by one entity. Um, and we're seeing that, I mean we could talk about co-ops in a minute, but you know, I, I say you know, in the proliferation of, un, of very big thing, products in the world and projects in the world and significant projects that are actually open source. So, you know, the, the three obvious ones are Linux, Wikipedia, and Apache. Apache servers run uh, half of the web. Linux runs all 500 of the top uh, of the supercomputers in, top supercomputers in the world. And, and Wikipedia is the biggest information product in the world. And they're all, in their own different way, open source. Android, which sits on 70% of all uh, smartphones, is also an open source operating system, albeit created by ruthlessly uh, capitalist pig type uh, companies as uh, 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 Google and Samsung, but they've used open, used open source as a way of, as a rivalry against Apple, whose products cannot be open source. So anyway, so some big things in the world are open source. There's some big modular, modular you know, forms of organization, big horizontal forms of organization. And the sum total of all this, I say, is that it makes a transition possible. You're going to get abundance in information goods because that, at zero price, you know, easily reproducible things are, are going to be abundant, should be abundant. Information wants to be free. There is an information layer to reality. I, in the book, I argue it's kind of a, a bit of a sort of nerdy debate that information is physical, that there's no information without representation in reality as mass and energy. And therefore, what we call virtual or cognitive capitalism is an illusion. It is, it, information is real. And, it, and, and, and as it trickles through to reality, you know, a, piece, a silicon chip is a, is a piece of silicon polished and then etched or printed on or stamped. Um, to a design. The design is the design. The silicon is silicon. Of course, there have been advances in the molecular structure of, of the silicon, but not the, the molecular structure of the silicon does not advance so fast as the design of advances. So what is a silicon chip? It's a design printed on a piece of silicon. And if you then ask yourself, where, you know, the information layer in, 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 in reality is actually not that small. Go into an art gallery, 25 years ago, and you can basically go, yeah, I like that, um, yeah, I don't like that, yeah, I can roughly see because of these guys got white roofs, so that's probably Renaissance, that's a naked woman, so it's probably modernist. You go and walking around like that, a kind of blind, you know, kind of sensory being, stick a pair of headphones on with an interactive guide to that art gallery, and you've suddenly got the whole of humanity's knowledge and actually Wikipedia in front of you, if you want. You've got an incredible machine to understand what you're seeing. And no, not even with Anthony Blunt on your shoulder, could you, because Anthony Blunt, you know, the famous uh, Queen's uh, uh, curator who was a spy, could, could have, uh, 
could have told you what Wikipedia can tell you about uh, what is in, say, you know, the National Gallery. So the information layer of the National Gallery is, is a good example, I use in the, in the book other examples, like the information layer of, a, of an aircraft. So the design of it is the information layer. The, the, the data it's spitting out back to Boeing HQ as it flies that make its, that make its maintenance far more efficient. There's an information layer. The information layer is, is, a, is something that economics just cannot describe. It can't decide whether it's use value. In the Marxist sense, it is simply utility or whether it's exchange, whether it is a, a commodity, something that is as exchange value. And all that the post-capitalism is, is a struggle over what the, what the free information that networks produce should be. It, so when a, if I network with you and I produce some information with all of you, no, uh, it goes floating up into an ethosphere of, um, a, a, as in the form of what economists call, economists call an externality. And, and the externality produced by networked interaction is huge, much more than an externality than produced by the old example was, you know, a power station that pollutes a river. That's an externality. Who pays for it? How do we work out who pays? The positive ex externalities, which are exponential, probably, in their size and growth, are really hard to, to put your finger on. And therefore, what I argue is that the positive ex externalities should be use value. They should be utilised by everybody. And in fact, you're not going to get the full, you're not going to get the full impact of the information technology revolution until they are simply utilised and not hidden behind private walled gardens. Um, th there's other conditions of the post-capitalist revolution, one of which will be automation, and therefore you've got to you've got to find new social forms to contain work and leisure it, to automate at least half of all jobs. But the the, the condition of freeing collectively produced information. I, I will put like this and I'll finish on this now we can maybe just talk about it. I once interviewed um, Larry Page, who is the boss of Google, or one of the two founders of Google. And I said to him after a kind of quite tortuous, because they're not great communicators, <laughs> quite, quite tortuous uh, thing. Go on then, you know, I was trying to think of a thing to say to him. I said, what, what, would you, what do you still want to do? You created Google, what would you, what's your ultimate ambition? And he went, in kind of that kind of zombie voice, he went, um, I want to create a machine that knows everything. Uh, and I think that, that's, that I want to build a machine that knows everything. And what I would say, I didn't say then, but knowing what I do now, what I would say is, the machine that knows everything cannot exist until every user of Google knows everything that Google knows. Because otherwise you're building a machine that only knows half of everything. It, can, it, it takes the wisdom of crowds and pre processes them according to its non-crowd, i.e. its own machine, but the crowd cannot interact with either the outcome of that, because we don't know what Google is doing with our in info, nor can we actually interact in the process of actually processing the stuff. So, you know, Proud as they are of Android as an open source product, a good thing for Google to do would be to open everything in Google to open source, which would immediately invalidate its share price, and then it would become a post-capitalist company. But that's, um, that's one way of trying to throw the... There's a lot more in the book about, as you say, agency and who can do it and what we become as human beings as the information technology revolution has animated our minds. But I thought I would give you that kind of general gist of the post-capitalist thesis to see if you wanted to come back at it and <coughs> talk about it. <coughs> well, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I, guess, um, I guess I'm interested in this, this um, what you're talking about in terms of the value mm. of the externalities, mm. in terms of plugging into them, yeah. and at the same time, an, like, attempts by sort of late capitalist mm. um, technological industries to take advantage of those externalities themselves. And that, that question is the political question in the, in the book, I'd say, which is, um, how uh, kind of the, the same question of, of the sort of who's the historical actor in terms of mm. um, taking taking control and how how do we build a um, a political and economic structure which uh, democratizes access to those externalities? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, in the book, I try and I, I, I veer away from the politics for a reason uh, you know, that I wanted to, and the, in the same way that I, that I slightly veer from environmentalism and limit the environmental agenda to one chapter 
explaining where it fits into it. I almost don't explain what you have to do in, in politics because th the point about something as complex as this is to actually ex to, 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 to lay out the economic argument. And it's not just, as you know, it's not just an economic argument, it's about a human transition. Those two things I thought were big enough that, you know, at the end of Das Capital, not even at the end of Das Capital Volume 3 or Theories of Surplus Value, Volume 1 to 5, or the Grundrisse, um, do you ever get, therefore we should smash the state? Uh, because I think it's, those, that it's complicated enough just in expressing what a commodity is. It takes a long time. I don't take that long. But, um, so, who can make it is a question that I do address. And I think it is this. We've understood very well, the kind of digital generation, the, the value of privacy. So, you know, I think one of the slogans of the kind of, you know, Electronic Frontier Foundation and all that is that, is that liberty in a modern world is privacy. Freedom is privacy. Because... If there's no privacy, the, levels of, the level of externalization of myself that is involved in this is huge. I mean, if, it's not just the communications. I, I was doing this documentary in Greece with a lot of young Greek people. Young Greek people uh, have this kind of strange attitude toward, there's quite a kind of religious, quasi-religious attitude towards uh, their personal lives and one of them is they they more or less basically if they're doing sort of if they've got a sort of slightly unconventional personal life what they'll often do is with each potential partner that they have or group of friends they have a different messaging app so that when they know that if it's tinder or whatever they come up with this or it's mm -hmm. if it's if it's you know if it's whatsapp it's got to be these guys it's quite uh, just being close to them watching them kind of all work like this so you've got these multiple personalities um, you know, expressed and externalised into devices. Leave aside, if I were to write a note to myself, or a little poem, or a draft of a poem, whatever, which I sometimes do, that's immediately externalised. So I, uh, if, if someone has a godlike view into my technology, which they have, um, I don't have the freedom to think. Because I, I, every time I think, I'm, ex I, I'm actually, and every time I, I think on paper, I'm potentially doing what a 16-year-old girl could prevent 20 years ago. She's writing in her diary on paper, lock it, hide it, nobody's going to see it. I write it here, the NSA sees it immediately. So to have freedom, I have to have privacy, and we've kind of understood that. What we haven't understood is that... that this, that same dynamic that has changed our relationship with you know, our self's relationship with external things also gives us the ability to, to quite quickly pursue and design liberatory arrangements in our lives. And in fact, if I go back to thinking about these young, young you know, kind of, kind of whizzy kind of people I work with, uh, what I think they're doing is designing a kind of area of self-liberation that they can live in using, obviously it's not just technology, they're living it as well. But the technology is important because it allows you to, to, to manage multiple things in, a, in an interesting way. And the, the, this, almost, one of the things I observed, uh, you know, kind of one of the advantages of being kind of 55 is that you've lived through the period of being uh, black and white CompuServe, you know, uh, bulletin boards. Uh, as soon as you got the internet, people started to create um, virtual and ideal communities because a bulletin board was effectively that. Then I went into Second Life very early on, when it, before it became a horribly pornographic and rubbish and, and full of Russian mafiosi. Um, but I was in Second Life and what I noticed was that everybody was creating ideal communities. And they, what, what I was sort of momentarily part of was a, a, a German social democratic village that floated in midair. You had to fly up to it and when you got there it was all Tudor buildings and people wearing chicken hats and drinking beer like this. But uh, it, you kind of understood, I understood the concept immediately and what is, you know, in the first moment in your history where we were able to build ideal communities virtually, we started building them. And all all that that person, if I'm sitting in a cafe in Athens, all these kind of young men and women doing this, all they're actually doing is building a virtual community ideally. Um, which, so I, I think that that tells us this, that we are, that to gain privacy, to gain freedom, 
we have to free ourselves from the control of states over technology mm -hmm. and at the same time to enact liberty we have to be able to produce and interact producing externalities network effects from our information without in an obligatory way valorizing somebody else's company we have to the true the true way of creating these online or virtual communities must be in a way that where we get the majority of the upside and are not dumb uh, kind of lemming what are we rats in a you know like in an experiment rats running around a uh, a, a maze yeah. for somebody else. Sorry, that was a long answer, but that, that's, that's my view of why technology propels us to desire more freedom in, in a different way and to clash with the very structures of, of uh, surveillance and privatisation of information. But I mean, um, th I mean, that thing fascinates me, the, the uh, creation of new, new identities um, that, or new communities from identities that previously would have existed, but not being able to connect with each other and then as a result of them being able to connect to each other online now the creation of um, other identities based upon the, that conversation that's ha had so for example the explosion in um, a, a sort of connected trans politics mm. which previously would have been super, yeah. very limited because there's a uh, control of your own forms of representation and a room for experimentation yeah. and that in itself creating new trans identities and new politics around those trans identities but what it seems to me is and you're saying that, that it's about who controls then those technologies that allow, mm -hmm. the, that allow those subjectivities to be created. Um, but, but, but within those, those groups, there is a natural tension and awareness at all times anyway, isn't there, of, of, who, of who controls this information. And you see both a pressure, to, a pressure on those organisations and people, if they're not working, just subverting them or going to new ones. So, for mm. example, Facebook introducing mm. 50 new pr uh, possible pronouns for mm. gender identities. Or, um, you know, I've lived through, I don't know, maybe 10 sort of um, monopoly um, uh, messaging systems in my life. You know, yeah. like, uh, when I was first on, online, yeah, I think I was using some sort of AOL-based um, chat and I've gone through all those things and Emerson Messenger, blah, blah, blah. Um, exactly as you say, for because it allows the creation of one person to have multiple different different identities within their one smartphone. Mm. Um, I guess I guess it's um, it, it seems to me that the the uh, I can't remember the phrase you use, but the the new networked uh, identities, the new transition identities, mm. and human relationships seem to already be existing, and perhaps. It's actually the technology that's push, pushing up behind it. Well, I think that the technology has has enabled it, and it, and, and it, sometimes it can be. It, it's really brutally obvious things um, that that are that are the enablers. And what are the enab the enablers of? If I if I think about the world into which I was born in the nineteen sixties, it was a world to say where my dad's generation would have valued the, the single self. So a working class you know, guy has to be the same person in everything. You go to the pub, they go to work, they go to the betting shop, they're on the football terrace. They are the same person and family home. Um, any chink of difference, in, you know, any chink of difference is an immediate signal that something weird is going on. Um, for, for example, I bet a lot of gay men who had to live in the closet in that era um, would have that's what they would have lived in fear of showing one chink of dip the one uh, go to one unusual pub enter a sauna you know in an unusual way and and all on a minute you're giving signals off here mm -hmm. of the thing you don't want to be in the Keynesian hierarchical world which is in any way two-tone two, you've got an, a, a, an overt and a covert existence now you know, 50 years on, it's completely the normal, the no, as in the book I call them white wire people, and I, got, I was in this tube carriage and I could basically do this exercise, good mental exercise. You just put everybody into two, two silos, um, network people and non-networked people. And obvious, some of it, once you start doing it, it's really obvious, people reading newspapers, you know, re just reading newspapers uh, with no other forms of uh, mental stimulus going on. They've not got wire in their ear. They're not looking at a phone. It's quite difficult to find that in London or Tokyo or, S or Sydney now. But you do find them. Or people 
people who can't work, people who go walk into a Starbucks and go, what, what, what do they serve again? You know, what is it again? Is it cappuccino? People who've not experienced modernity. But then most of us have actually experienced modernity and, or post-modernity. And, we can, and we, we, we're used to this kind of multi, this kind of bombardment of choice, bombardment of information. And so that's where the multiple identity thing, I think, comes from. But then what you're talking about is once you're in that world, it's, it, it's, it's, I, feel, I feel, it feels to me almost a kind of unstoppably libera liberatory. And that can be in different ways. You know, you, once you're in the world of Islamic preaching online, you can, you, you're almost on an unstoppable uh, journey towards radicalised, you know, radicalised. You, you want to act. You want to go online and be in a computer game and shoot things. And then you may do real things. And I think it's also true of, you know, a lot of people's sexuality is expressed online. It starts with one thing and then you realise, shit, you know, a lot of other people are doing X, Y or Z and, and, and there's more. Uh, we're only 10 years into this revolution or 15 years into this revolution. And I think it's just even getting our heads around what it is, is really difficult. And in the book, I try and do it economically. But I think there's an equal... You know, I'm thinking about, right, if I write something else, writing simply about the human transition, which I talk about in kicking off and talk about there as, uh, as, as being actually the, the ultimate interesting thing. Yeah, um, and it's, I mean, and, and also the, the, the lines between, um, between the online and the offline and, uh, are, are rapidly completely emerging um, mm. in terms of we now live in a real like augmented reality in terms yeah. of the way, especially even cities, where you do deal with cities and how mm. people navigate the city and stuff on their yeah. phones and they can't, can't do it without, without it, which we, we saw even as early as 2005 of the, um, the tube bombings, yeah. that, that people just had no way of understanding how to navigate home without those sy systems that the computer yeah. had set up for them. Um, Right, right through to uh, yeah, the way people use say dating apps now, and the fact that the geolocation aspect of those things. Yeah, um, I, I do. I, I'm, there's an interesting thing you raise in the book about this, uh, the worker, sub the new worker subjectivity, where you talk about Keynesianism. I think this is right as, as something of like a, a brief. Changes um, within Keynesianism weren't necessarily taken up by workers pushing as far as. That we had a period of, of brief respite or truce yeah. between yeah. between capital and labour there, yeah. and that that's now is that now dissipating or is it? Are we returning to a, a, a sort of a clash in in that form, or are we developing into a new uh, a, a new a new era where the workers are more likely to take take mm. the lead over well, capital? Well, my thinking has evolved on this, and if you if anybody has actually read uh, some of my other books, including uh, what, uh, the one called uh, "Live Working or Die Fighting." When I was writing that, I tended to look at the post-war, post-1945, so 45 through to about 75, era of class peace as being an anomaly within the history of the global working class that would be, you know, once neoliberalism broke down the class peace, then, then we would go back uh, to new to forms of, you know, flamboyant, gestural, individual, uh, anarchistic, struggle that my dad's generation had so clearly forgotten about that they didn't realise that they ever existed mm -hmm. because of the social peace that ex ex existed in Northern Hemisphere countries in, after World War II. But now what I tend to see is that is, is more of a journey forward, that there's no going back in either direction to the peacefulness of the Keynesian era or to the, to the pure class consciousness of, and class action of before that. And the reason is information. In the book, I, I, I mean, some people don't realize that, that there's been an objection from some right-wing people that there's even a sort of, uh, what is it, for big, you know, big 12, 14,000 word chapter on the history of the working class in this book that's meant to be about the future. Uh, but believe me, it was 20,000 words before Penguin got their hands on it. Because I see it as absolutely critical to understand what has happened to the working class technologically. And so what I tried to do is to retell that story of, of, of labor from the point of view of skill. And what I, my argument is, first of all, Marxism has continually m underestimated the importance of skill in overcoming uh, innovation. And so you basically you get 
automation, innovation, and then the creation of new skills on that that recreate the, the existence of a skilled layer. The skilled layer almost never goes away. And in, in various forms of Marxist theory, whether it's Marx and Engels or whether it's Lenin, there's, they, that skilled labor is always seems temporary and anomalous. And so I, I try and, first of all, replace that in, in work labor history. And then I say, the interesting thing about, say, it's a bit of autobiographical writing in this. And so I go, OK, what, is, what was class consciousness up to 1945? And I use my grandma as an example. And she was an incredibly class conscious, militant person who's a cotton weaver and was the wife of a miner and lived in a very violent and robustuous uh, lifestyle. And um, for her, class consciousness was sublogical. So the, it, logic was for, here's how you train a puppy, here's how you prune a rose. But she never told me, here's what class consciousness is, or here's how you organise a strike, or why. It was all to do with implicit things, gestures, size, you know, kind of um, doing a small actions for people in a way that, that clearly signifies something else, or a, a level of solidarity. You get to my dad's generation after the war, and Richard Hoggart writes about this. Is what Richard Hoggart's are absolutely panicking about in the uses of literacy. The, he calls it the decline of the, of the what does he call it? Is it common proletarian way of life or is that Hobbsbaum's? That's Hobbsbaum's term. Basically, the, the, the common popular life that I'm describing with my grandma gets dissolved with my dad's generation because, because knowledge just infiltrates formal knowledge. So you can, instead of having to sort of intuit class consciousness, you can actually read stuff. Mm -hmm. Then you look at what they're watching on TV, watching on film, on the movie screen, reading. It is all books about <laughs> discontented young workers who hate the working class lifestyle. Lucky Jim, uh, Saturday Night, Saturday Sunday, night morning. Sunday Morning, uh, Billy Liar. They're all sort of slightly D-class young men. And, and of course the other thing is, is that they're allowed to read about and write about sex because each one of these books and films is about that as well. That's new as well. And so by the... The, the, the Marcuse generation of people thought, well, OK, Marcuse, uh, uh, Daniel Bell, all these other people thought, that's it for the working class, it's over. But by the 60s, they're, they're completely bourgeoisified, they're, they're distracted, they're no longer alienated by capitalism, and they have a level of knowledge that means they can't struggle. And then, bam, late 60s, early 70s, the whole thing kicks off. It's the highest, probably the, the most militant moment leaving aside, say, the early 20s in working class history worldwide. And then the question is, why did it subside so easily? And we in the traditional left had this narrative of, well, it, it was because they defeated us or because we were betrayed or because the Trotskyism was only discovered too late to have influence or, you know, these, this was a time when sort of um, Lotta Continua had thousands of members in Italian factories, when the SWP had hundreds of members in British car factories, ordinary workers, not students, sent in to, to infiltrate them. Why? Why did it all go to shit for, the, for that militant working class? And I think it is because people coming out of it, leaving aside the defeats of Thatcherism or the non-defeats of wherever, Argentina or wh other 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 areas of working class struggle, they come out with actually a more self-actuated individuality that just doesn't, it will not go back in the box even of the Keynesian trade union mm -hmm. movement and it will certainly not go back in the box of what the society that created my grandma and granddad. It, it's going in a forward direction and so that's a long answer sorry, but the fa last sentence of the answer is and therefore what I've tried to do is to describe that as a moment of sublation, that is, of, of <coughs> replacement and improvement on the working class. I see us, Solaria, you work for a co-op, co I work for a capitalist company, whatever, we're still the Solaria. I see us, we're, not, we're no longer primarily defined by work. The thing my dad's generation had in common with the 200 year before generations that he, that he was descended from, factory workers, is that their entire lives were defined by work in a way that ours isn't. So I, I see that as the legitimate uh, grounds for claiming there is a moment of, of qualitative sublation going on. Yeah. But what, how does that fit in with a, you know, the, a lot of stuff, you, you know, your political obsessions and background, how does that fit in with, with what, what your my personal? No, well, you, I mean, you've oh, been, uh, we know each other as kind of yeah. activists, artists, you know, how does that fit in with you? Um, well, I, uh, I mean, it rings very true. I think, um, I think what's interesting about the examples you use is that actually the, uh, there were p 
political organisations that emerged that could not not hold in those those new identities that have come out of the Keynesian box, mm. but um, but but activate them mm. and, and use them in some ways, which is mm. what we saw in Italy in the seventies, which is why it continued that that, that period continues for yep. so, such a long period. Um, and I think that's the, the process that we're undergoing at the moment is the, the um, uh, you know thirty years after the Italians, yeah. uh, which is the the slow. Um, recreation of maybe some political forms which can uh, not hold those identities into a box but which can be dragged along by by those new identities and I think that's a lot a lot of political discussion ha is happening at the moment We're, is also in this transition period mm. um, I'm interested in how that that works in terms of organizations and especially organizations of work mm. um, this these new identities that we're talking about where you're saying that we are no longer defined by work doesn't ring true to me at all uh, we just don't explicitly say that but actually I think when I think of all those people within that salariat I think that they probably think about work a lot more mm. like their, their, their whole identities are what they're as you said before is what they're selling to their companies um, mm. that, that they're not paid they don't clock in and clock out but they're expected to be talking at nine o'clock in the evening at a party they go to about something to do with their their work mm. making those connections and networking mm. the whole time that this process of networking and the blurring of the individual identity and the workplace identity mm. is becoming um, I think very very oppressive for a lot of the people who are involved I mean mm. I, I, I can no longer keep my my sep my identities which I've tried and tried to keep separate in some ways from from actually batting up against each other because um, the way my work is organized and the way my social life is organized is positively encouraging me to draw the experiences into each other mm. um, and I have to say like working in a cooperative is the first actually the first time where I've felt um, a lot more in control of mm. uh, those identities and I can actually mm. can actually draw a line at some point between between the workplace and 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 otherwise yeah I mean you get like modern day problems though don't you I mean, I don't know whether we want to have a Q&A or something, yeah, but, but I mean, there's a kind of modern day problem. How can I, I'll, I'll anonymize this. So I'm working in one particular um, you know, capitalist kind of company and um, somebody turns up um, who is uh, a gay man. And, uh, and I worked out afterwards what was going on because one of the other employees who we were all working with had gone up to him and said, what do I call you? you know, <laughs> is it the, the name that, that I call you on the scene? Or is it actually the yeah. name that you got on this badge? Because I didn't know that was your name. <laughs> he goes, well, of course you call me this name that's on my badge. I'm, you know, I'm your boss now. And it was like, it was an interesting thing though, but it is a first world, it's not a first world problem. It's a 21st century problem. Yeah. Um, probably 19th century problems like that for people in like Oscar Wilde's, you know, general, uh, you know, scenario, general area. But what I'm saying is that, is that yeah, the, 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 multiple, uh, the multiple personality thing, I think, yes, yes, work is seeping into it. I know what you mean. But I also think that we, we conditionally do the work. You know, we conditionally do the work. I mean, I also, with a struggle as well. I mean, you're working for a workers' co-op. I hope that means that, or I co-op, you, you, that you identify with it and in a way that probably you wouldn't identify with an ultra-capitalist, oppressive, you know, we don't care, fuck you type company. Mm -hmm. Um, but even then, do you, do, do you take that identity um, and, 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 and uncritically, uncritically sort of, you can't because, because as Richard Sennett points out in all his studies of, of modern work, is that, that it's, the, the work is so mercurial, the loyalty of the organisation to you is so little that you can't go investing your entire life like people did when you know, they get the kind of gold watch or the clock at the end of you know, 20 years of working with the same company. You can't go invest in your identity with that. You, you bring, I think it's, I, my tendency is to think of, I know people who work like cameramen or camera women or VT editors in my profession. They're generally identified as that and they'll often work, they'll, they'll often be in collaborative competition with other cameramen, other VT editors. At, and so it's work that's defining them, but not going, I work for the BBC, you work for ITN, you know, up yours. They're not doing that anymore, mm -hmm. I don't think. Okay, um, do we have time for questions, John? Yeah, is there any questions in the audience? Or comment. Or like comments. Yeah, good. Yeah. We might have to repeat them for people who are listening to the yeah. live stream. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm 
one question. Um, obviously, at the beginning, you talked about how you didn't think the walled garden approach that certain companies trying to set up to create value for information content mm. was going to last. And at the same time, you also talked about how there is a, a tier, of, you know, double tier of jobs that are yeah. so low skilled and low paid that they may well be all automated at some point mm. in the future. Mm. So, where in this economy is there scope for value mm. to be created in the future? If information isn't worth, going to be worth a vast amount, or for, for the creators as well as the companies that can manage yeah. that. So, what's what's the scope for getting decent pay across a wider yeah. scope thing? And, and and secondly, also, obviously, we talked about certain types of knowledge led. Uh, employment and, 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 and work here today. Um, obviously, the people that are here um, are, are sort of involved in that, but it's still atypical of the workforce as a, as a whole. And it's great. So, what is the scope for this workers led, sort of high skill, um, quite loose um, approach to the wider economy? Because most people mm. still go through their lives, even though they're not mm. working for the same company at every stage of the they are still working for. One company doing something quite dull and monotonous, and so you know, mm -hmm. for a paper factory in Slough or whatever, you know, throughout life. So, what is what is the maximum scope of this type of yeah. fluid um, um, economic activity? Well, I first think of all think that one of the most important things I'm trying to do with this book is to put a name to this problem, because once you can say actually. Uh, we're doing this, but, but the, the capitalist company is capturing all the externalities and all the value. And if we didn't, it would be a different kind of economic, uh, a, a society organized around different economic priorities. And you could call it post-capitalism or not, depending on what you want to do. But you can, you can basically then understand that there is a thing, that there's an, un an unannounced strug struggle over the externalities going on. So, 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 so that, that's the first thing, putting a name to it is important. Now, where, where's the scope for creation of value? Let's look at a concrete example. Um, music acts or musicians find it really difficult to make money from, from recorded music. And that is a change going from, you know, because the, the money they were making from recorded music, probably, I, I have a hunch, overtook live performance, it's certainly by the sort of mid, mid 1920s, because the co combination of radio and vinyl was able to maximize you know, the, the, an uncopyable product through an, a, a monopolized uh, uh, channel to market, so vinyl shops and then radio itself, which you were paid for. Uh, that, that's fairly clearly been there for nearly 90 years for artists, and then it's all gone. So what's the reaction? I mean, Billy Bragg says to me, you know, I don't give a shit about my recording. He'd say, obviously, I give a shit if somebody's pirating my work. Well, let's try and stop it. Let's not do it. But what we do, Glastonbury sells out within three hours. Glastonbury is where you make your money. Mm -hmm. you, so music acts will make money through live performances. Um, and I think a lot of music acts understand that is where they're going to make their money. Right. Now, suppose they do. What's the problem with the live performance? What's the problem sort of opportunity with the live performance? There's only so many acts can get on stage in a night. Right. So you've got scarcity. That's good because it means people will pay for the scarce. Uh, and then they, but the, the more subliminal thing is who captures the externalities? I think the externalities at a gig a ca or at a dance club are captured by the human beings in the gig or dance club in the form of they can do all kinds of things that you know that are not the, the normal externalities of being at, at a gig are you can jump up and down and feel good about things get your muddy eat a, a burger buy some jewelry from a stall uh, meet somebody you might like to sleep with and sleep with them if it's a if it's a if it's a festival um, these are amazing things that human beings do and they're externalities of because all you paid for was going to a gig that's what all you actually pay for. But then you get all these other extra things, which you can't, it, it, you know, actually, once the music is digital, you, you're losing all of that, right? So that's, that's, that's where I think, that's the capitalist. Uh, the way, the, the, way the, the, the response to externality capture within capitalism is to go, all right, well, we can seek the physical, we can seek the analog as, the, as where the value remains. Because in the, and look at it in this profession. I'm sitting here for free talking to you, and brilliant, it, that's great. But, and then, but like, there's a whole sudden industry 
of weird events where you turn up and you do your book signing and you realise people have paid 12 quid to somebody to come to them. But why? Again, because they want to be there in the physical presence of real people talking about things. There's, like, I think about the Sunday papers or the School of Life I went to on Sunday morning. So there's a really interesting uh, return to analogue because digital is not going to do it. Now, on the other hand, in the digital world, then I think we then have to, re those of us who do digital creation, are you creating content? You, we have to then think about what would be the logical thing for us to do with the value in the digital space. And I think the logical thing would be to maximise, as far as you can, the, the return on copyright, on intellectual property, early in the life of a thing, and then to, to accept that it naturally will decay uh, quite sort of like, like that. Now, normal copyright law goes, you know, there's the return, it stays for 50 years, you, you have to pay me X to play my record on the, on, the, on the radio, and then after 50 years, it falls off. Hollywood wants to simply extend that for another, for like, as, many, as, as far into the future as it possibly can. But what I just tells you is that in, in any, once you look at copyright through the lens of somebody who understands digital content, it, copyright's just a construction. It's a social construct. And we could reconstruct it to be more rewarding to, in the short term. So that's why, interestingly, that, the Green Party's thing about copyright fading after 12 years, I thought was quite a logical thing. Mm -hmm. Copyright on generic drugs uh, you know, was forced by India on the HIV, on the HIV uh, treatments to become generic and, and the copyrights, i.e. the intellectual property, were blown apart by social pressure. And I think then if you're in the job of creating, it makes you ask, why do I do it? You do it because for very many different personal and, and human reasons. Even scientists who are creating these drugs are not doing them so they can be copyrighted for 40 years. The companies organising them are, but a post-capitalist drug industry, pharma industry, could easily operate with reward uh, focused on the innovation process and not the exploitation phase. I mean, this is one of the key things with um, talking about uh, the relationship of, of the Solaria uh, to what mm. you talked to with the externalities is this idea of the Napster moment, which is that mm. the technology has blown apart the ability to enforce a lot of these uh, things that were previously taken as mm. um, socially understood laws with mm. regards to intellectual mm. property. And the moment that it becomes possible to subvert <coughs> those laws without being arrested, you, re you suddenly realise that that industry has no credibility in asserting those laws, that, that mm. people don't uh, intrinsically see um, copyright as a, uh, the long-term effects of copyright as a, as a, as a, as a socially just um, mechanism for controlling the way intellectual property moves. Otherwise, they wouldn't, mm. they wouldn't um, mm. pirate, mm. you know. Yeah. So, so, so there's, for, for years, people, the, the uh, music industry went on charging more and more and getting increased profits which led to this complete collapse of credibility mm. when technology allowed. Mm. I also think there's one other extra thing, especially in the, level of, uh, in the world of creativity, what the, the, the digital equivalent of, of setting up the gig or the Sunday paper session is to produce a digital product that, that is so amazing that, that in its complexity cannot be copied. I don't mean that it's like too complex to do copy and paste, but it's probably an interaction of several things, space, time, uh, or aural, visual, that I, I think we haven't, people will pay for things that are incredibly valuable to them. Mm -hmm. um, that even when they can be pirated or copied, um, they, they will go on paying for the, for the real thing. Um, so probably the book is not the greatest example of that. But like, people still buy graphic novels, because you, you do not want to read a graphic novel in a, in a, on a PDF, it's yeah. just important. You, that I, somebody give me a graphic novel, I went and did a book signing, and she came down and said, I do graphic novels, here's my novel. And all I can remember from reading, it's a beautiful little thing, uh, book, like a thriller, and all I can remember was the, the slickness of the pages of the ink, and the smell of the ink, which books, because you know graphic novels have this inky smell. So that, yeah, you, anyway, other questions or things like that? Go on. Uh, I see in terms of what you're, you're saying is quite general, and how much of you, you say this applies to Western society or UK, yeah. US, and how much would you apply to <coughs> Global South uh, regions, um, or, or do you think it's just a matter of time in terms of technology penetrating that they will 
we face these same issues yeah. and go down and say, well, or do you think it, it, it's, this is a kind of a general thing yeah. or more region specific or... Do you know, you can... breakfast, tea, because he worked several shifts at once. And then what happened around about 2005, internet cafes came into the communities. So even if, when they were still work, living in dorms, outside the dorm, on the street, you'd go to internet cafes. And when you peek through the door, you see hundreds of workers spending their very meagre leisure time on screens. Now, we've got some sociology around that. You only get studies of these things three or four years afterwards and the sociology says when the internet cafe came into the workers district one of the most important things was that when you were sitting in the internet cafe the hierarchy of the factory was no longer applying to you and it was seen as natural that the foreman could come and sit next to you but you weren't meant to kowtow to the foreman even if they could slap you around the head in the factory and then of course now Mobile connections have overtaken desktop connections for the first time two years ago in China and everybody's got the internet cafe in their pocket and now you've had the first strikes organised through messaging services. So wow, you know, it's there. No, of course they go out and then what we're talking about is abundance versus scarcity and the global south you've still got massive scarcity of you know, raw material, people walking around with water on their heads in an African village, you know, carrying the water hours and hours a day. So. You know, I'm not saying that the, 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 the methods of digital you know, post-capitalism can solve that because the scarcity problems have to be solved. However, information can solve a lot of problems around capacity utilisation. So if you had an Uber for water carriers you know, in a, in a, say, a, a sub-Saharan Africa setting, now how would you get that? Well, in Kenya you've got... Um, You've got M-Pesa, where you've got basically, um, you can send money from village to village without any money changing hands. It's just a local money lender, village money lender gives out the money because he gets a text from another person. And it's all reconciled as in the medieval banking system was you know, afterwards. And I would imagine you could probably do something with resource utilization like that. But yeah, uh, the, the vision is that highly, highly automated are provide you the best basis for, for creating, and not just creating, for finding, mapping and exploiting the already existing post-capitalist economy. Because I'm actually saying, without, I'm not saying it'll naturally grow over from one to the other, like sort of 19th century social democrats said. I'm saying, if you look hard, you find a post-capitalist economy. And one, one of the things you could do, say in a council like Lambeth, you're in Lambeth here, aren't you? Mm -hmm. You could go, right, or in South London, where is the post-capitalist economy in, in, in South London? And what, how big is it? And, and what, would it, what would it take to synergise it to be 50% bigger? You know, I don't think we do that. We just go, oh, workers' co-ops are nice. Or the co-op as a bank is a nice place. Maybe you should bank with the co-op because you do cooperatives. You know, mm -hmm. we've got time for one more question. Anybody? Yeah, one more question. Go on. Anybody? I've got a quick provocative on, question, on. if that's right. what, um, Given what you've been saying about um, this change in subjectivity and the, this technological uh, development and the, the people looking and sort of inching their way forward to some sort of um, post-capitalist mm. economy and political uh, framework or something, why do so many of... Um, uh, why, why, has, uh, why do so many of that demographic within the UK seem to be supporting Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a genuine question. It, no, what's it, are, no, what's see, it say about the, that identity? It's really funny. It, it was really funny. You know, the Panorama spent half an hour, is it last night, uh, doing the Jeremy Corbyn phenomenon. And they missed the Jeremy Corbyn phenomenon. The phenomenon is why have tens of thousands of young people who don't give a shit about the concept of labour or any of the issues that Jeremy Corbyn has traditionally you know, been obsessed with, like, to be honest, Hamas and Hezbollah and all this, why have they gone to him is uh, the, 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 that's the interesting question now before you give the obvious answers which is that every time people are allowed to vote for something that is tangibly non-neoliberal they seem to vote for it so 
you know, Scotland, you're offered this, the accidental chance to break away from the oldest neoliberal em, em, imperialist country in the world. And, and, and nearly half the people go, yes, please, let's do it. <laughs> and then in, in Greece, because, see, I still think Greece has been accidental, because the centrist parties were so corrupt and so un, un, unable to reform themselves and understand that just don't do the austerity, do less of it, that you get Syriza comes along out of nowhere. And again, a lot of people who support Syriza, who voted Syriza and probably may not vote for them anymore, um, are exactly that. Again, it's, it's the, the, the networked, poly, whatever, you know, uh, mo young people who live a free lifestyle and they go, yeah, like, they, yeah, they're all right because the others are assholes. So, and then you get, so you get Scotland, you get the Syriza, you've got Podemos, you get, you know, you get now Corbyn. It's just, it just people, you, they're finding escape routes. But the, one of the reasons I wrote the book is exactly because when they look for these escape routes, what they're often doing is pouring their energy into an, an, an archaic form. Either series is an incredibly hierarchical uh, movement. It's not even a movement, it's a <coughs> small party. It's not much bigger than it. You know, it's 20,000 people. You know, they all, all the cadres of it know each other. Uh, and have lived through many tri trials and tribulations as, as old-style Marxists. Corbyn, you know, Corbyn's inner circle is incredibly small and weak. And it's got a little tiny inner circle of people who are trying to operate the Corbyn thing. You know, it's not all with Len McCluskey at Unite HQ pulling the levers. And yet I was, I was talking to somebody last night who was involved in it. He said they had a... You know these foam banks? You see these foam banks? I went to Liz Kendall's one. It was about in the size of this room. They had one for Jeremy Corbyn and 350 people turned up to man, to staff, the foam banks. Of course, there wasn't 30, 350 phones. So you just had to give people lists of numbers and they did it on their own mobiles. Um, but, you know, it, that's almost a literal example of there not being a big enough machine or hierarchy to actually contain what people desire to do. Or process the ideas that are coming from those people. And we don't know what their, I mean, their ideas are clearly, they've, they've joined the Labour Party and they clearly have, you know, very similar organic left, leftish ideas about stuff. You know, but the other, the other thing is about, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a no brainer if you know about this world that I'm writing about, the, the idea of the swarm, which when we first, you know, started experiencing it, in, like in the student mm -hmm. struggles, was quite new to me. But the swarm, you come together, do stuff, achieve something, go and break apart with no intrinsic sort of hierarchical commitment to each other. You know, I've been in the Labour Party for 50 years. You, you don't do that anymore. You just achieve Corbyn or whatever they're going to achieve and then probably break apart and try and achieve something else, go and occupy something or get... what? How many people did it take to get Pizza Express to pay, its, uh, pay the full whack or ask that have now done it, haven't they? Yeah. Ask and uh, somebody else has done it. Um, about five people, you know, about, uh, not many people standing up in Pizza Expresses and shouting until they... So th people can realise that the, 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 there, are there are big achievable things you can do with these methods. But, yeah, so, and then occasionally they, they kind of pour into these old structures. Uh, it, in Iran, they used to call it wave creation in the, the 2009 revolution. The activists called it wave creation so you'd create a wave around something and then you'd realize that a wave had subsided so you move to a different issue or type of activity i think that's what sp people spontaneously do so once they've done corbyn and pissed off the bbc some more they can do something else you know but i don't know what that doing is going to be okay i think that's Brilliant. all we've got time for it's great thank, thank you, you for listening Thanks, Thank you. Good.